Our gracious Father in heaven, we come to you this morning in Jesus' name. We come, Lord, celebrating the transforming touch that has been exhibited in these precious lives today. We come to give you praise and glory for who you are and for what you have done, but also, Lord, for what you will continue to do. As we come to this place of worship, unify our hearts, we ask. Send your holy angels to encamp about this sanctuary and your Holy Spirit to find a place in our hearts to plant the seeds of joy and eternal life. And so, Lord, we commit ourselves to you this, your blessed Sabbath day, and may the joy that we desire come and fill our hearts. May we worship with a sense of your holiness, and may Jesus be exalted and given the glory that he alone is due. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today, as now, we will invite the baptismal candidates up forward as we will do the uh, baptism. And we invite Elder Sean to share a little bit uh, just before they come. So we invite the baptismal candidates to make their way up here as well. Yeah. Good morning and a very happy Sabbath. This morning, I'm very happy because one of my Bible students, Megan, uh, she's uh, baptized today, right? Uh, Megan is definitely an answer to um, our prayers, my wife and myself prayer. Uh, you know that I have been very active in the SDA church for many years. But if I remember correctly, she's the first Bible student I had, I have, that is not from the Seventh-day Adventist family, not the... Uh, uh, not a uh, children or not a friends of the Seventh-day Adventist. So that's very exciting for me. So during the COVID, uh, it was uh, really a low point in terms of my spiritual life, all right, because of the COVID situation and we were not allowed to come to church and there was very minimal uh, interaction. And I prayed to the Lord, for Bible students and the Lord answered my prayers, our prayers, my wife and my prayers and gave me four students and Megan is one of the four students and I realized how inadequate I, I am, right, uh, in giving Bible studies, especially the Daniel and Revelation and I, when I meet people from a different Christian denomination or persuasion, uh, I was from excitement to frustration to eventually uh, coming up, uh, uh, stumbling upon the, uh, the book of Acts on how Paul connected with the Athens. So I began to study uh, how to give Bible study on Revelation and Daniel that, uh, that with an understanding how the futurists would interpret it. So, and it became my own personal revival. Therefore, this morning I'd like to encourage you to pray to the Lord for Bible students and you can experience your own personal revival too. And a word of encouragement for Megan. Megan is, a, is definitely a very diligent and um, student, Bible student. She asks very insightful questions uh, of which I have from time to time um, have to go back and study and then come back with the answer. So she's really a good student. This morning uh, you graduated from my class but you are graduating into the community the embrace of the community of the Ballester Road Seventh Day Adventists, right? Uh, like all the members that have helped you in this process, I'm honored to be part of it. And I know that Kenny uh, made a lot of efforts to call you back to church after the COVID to a Bible study. I'm thankful for all the friends. And many of your friends in the kitchen crew, right? Paul Georg and the team that helped you to assimilate so well. And she has been very generous in sharing her talent in cooking, and food uh, every week without fear, uh, without fear with, uh, with us all. So this morning, praise to God for your decision and welcome you to our family and the rest of the candidates too. For whatever reasons you have making your decision, I'm sure you will be into the embrace of the Ballester Road Seventh-day Adventist community. Thank God for all of you. Praise the Lord.
All right, this time we will be having the baptismal vows and uh, we'll be doing it in English and Cantonese as well because uh, we have two of our seniors who Pastor Yuan gave Bible studies in Cantonese. And after we do each vow, we will have them raise their right hand in acceptance of it. We have gone through the 13 uh, vows and this is the alternate three vows uh, which before the church, uh, later after they have accepted, we will also ask you to raise your hands and to accept them into our church. Okay, the first vow is in English. Do you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord? And do you desire to live your life in a saving relationship with Him? Now, 所以在受洗之前 Well, you all understand Cantonese too. Good. <laughs> amen, amen. Okay. Second, do you accept the teachings of the Bible as expressed in the Statement of Fundamental Beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? And do you pledge, by God's grace, to live your life in harmony with these teachings? Okay, I use the tongue to uh, lead them for the second baptismal vow. Lee是否接受基督福臨安息日會基本信仰中所表達的聖經教訓並且願意靠著上帝的恩典過著一種符合聖經原則的一個生活如果一個是願意的請你舉起右手表示 Third is, do you desire to be baptized as a public expression of your belief in Jesus Christ, to be accepted into the fellowship of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and to support the church and its mission as a faithful steward by your personal influence, tithe and offerings, and a life of service? This is the third or third thing. 並願意藉上受浸直至公開表示你是相信基督加入基督福臨安息會這個團契並立志做個忠心的管家以十分之一同其他的捐獻以及個人的努力同埋影響力來支持教會Thank you Okay, at this time, uh, we ask that you may raise your hands in response to accept them into our church. Okay, thank you. You have seen these hands. We are welcoming you warmly to our church and we look forward to being together with you uh, in this church till Jesus comes. Alright, at this time, we do have several gifts and we invite uh, Marcella to give the, my wife to give the flowers and also we have a gift specially for each one of you. We also invite uh, those who have been giving Bible studies as well as their close friends and families to come up together. So we will start first with Mr. Lee and then Madam Lee and we go in this order. Okay. okay, this is for Mr. Lee. This is the Chinese Bible so that he can read it uh, as he continues to grow as a Christian. And then we also have flowers for them, which uh, my wife Marcella will pass.
And for Madam Lee, we have a plug telling about in Chinese about Jesus' love that we, Pastor Yuan will be passing. For me, uh, sorry, wrong order. Anyway, okay, for Megan, this is a cup uh, of verses, and every time she drinks, we remember that Jesus is her living water. Kasia, I hope I pronounced the name correctly. Uh, this is the book, The Great Controversy, as uh, we may continue to live your life and share also with your family. Family and friends, please uh, prepare to come up. This is for Brother Jimmy. It's our 28 Fundamental Beliefs Exposition. Uh, so for him, he's, we are happy to see that he's a digital missionary uh, answering questions in the Adventist World Radio. He's already started starting. So we give him the exposition of the 28 Fundamental Beliefs so he can understand more and explain to others as well. Alright, we invite uh, please all the family and friends and Bible students, Elder Sean, Sister Ross, and who else has come? Okay. Kenny, Brother Chongjin, and whoever has been involved and, uh, in their lives, uh, Elder Kenner, Sister Lillian, family and friends, please all come up as we will take a picture together. Whoever has been involved in their lives through their Bible study or their close friends and family, please come forth. Anyone else whose name I have not mentioned who have been involved in their Bible study or their close friends and family, please also come forward as we will take a picture together. So invite Pastor John and uh, Lama Kang and, and uh, Angela as well up to take a picture together, as well as Pastor Yuan and his wife, and also yeah, my wife as well. As well as my wife, please come up as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you everyone. Yeah, you may be seated. Uh, for the, those who are giving testimonies, maybe you can sit here first. And uh, for the Mr. Mr. and Madam Lee, your testimony is on video, so you may proceed. Okay, this time we will hear a short testimony about two to three minutes from each one who is being baptized. Uh, we start with Mr. and Madam Lee. They have recorded a video together with uh, Sister Maisie and Kenny who explain their faith journey. Today is a very special day for me and Kenny. About eight years ago, I've asked the church to pray for my mom. Back then, she had stage four breast cancer. Fast forward, my mom is going to be baptized today. God has answered not one, but two of our family most unceasing prayers. Both of them, my mom and her brother, have surrendered their life to Jesus. Last Sabbath, Pastor John Lomakin said, When Jesus is nowhere to be found, there is nowhere that Jesus cannot be found. I'm convinced that 
all this while the Lord is with us when we are praying. I'd like to thank all my best friends and all my teammates who has joined us in this journey of prayer. I'd like to show you, here is how my mom wants to express herself in Cantonese. Amen. <laughs> Today is an extraordinary day for me. Praise God. My sister, my brother, and uh, my dear friend, Lynn Megan, they have decided uh, to surrender their hearts to Jesus and follow Him all the way. Over the year, we have been talking to my brother about God's salvation, but he rejected it all. Lucy and I did not give up but continue to pray for him. A couple of years back, he has an angiogram. And uh, this year, he lost his left eye due to glaucoma. And his health is getting weaker. One very day, that was a prompting in my heart that I need to talk to my brother about his salvation again. I. I visited him with a heavy heart and uh, with much prayer. And on that day, God is merciful. He healed my brother's heart. And to my surprise, he accepted the offer that I arranged a pastor to have Bible study with him. Thank you, God, for sending a uh, pastor in with his uh, Cantonese uh, ministry. Now I show you how my brothers recite John 3.16 during one of the lessons. Amen. As for my sisters, uh, it's another awesome uh, testimony of how God has led her to the joy of salvation. Though she does not know how to read, but she has tapped onto the powerful lifeline and that's prayer. She prays whenever she is uh, in fear or when she needed help. As for Megan, I know her three years ago in church. I kept my friendship with her and God is good. God sent her back to after the church reopened. Thank you, Elder Son, for giving uh, Megan the Bible study. Praise God. Megan also decided to surrender her life to Jesus and follow Him all the way. It's indeed a grand day that we are born into the kingdom of God. Right, uh, Mr. Megan, you can share your testimony. Yeah. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Uh, I don't have any uh, impactful testimony to share. Uh, my life has been very blessed and protected. So, uh, I was raised from a, in, in a Christian family of a different de de denomination and um, uh, I was introduced to Christian another Christian denomination right um, before I found seven day Adventist um, I I like the teachings uh, of Seventh Day Adventists because they follow the Bible and it, it is very consistent. And so, um, uh, I seek for the truth um, that is being presented. Uh, so, uh, 
And I'm very grateful to um, Pastor Bayou, who first started to give me uh, Bible studies before the COVID pandemic. But then um, during the COVID pandemic, when everything is shut down, uh, I was very busy with work, so we did not continue until the reopening of the uh, church and Pastor Sean, no, Elder Sean and Sister Ross has generously given up their time and to give me Bible study so that I could um, uh, finally be baptized. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm very happy that I, I can reaffirm my faith yeah, and give my heart to Jesus again. That's all. Yeah. Amen. Amen. All right, next we will have uh, Sister Katya to share her testimony. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. It is a, a great pleasure to be here in this wonderful day. The Bible says that in the book of Proverbs, chapter 22, verse 6, train up the child the way he should go, and when he is old, he, would not, he shall not depart from it. God has been an amazing God to me in my life. He saved my life from death five times that I could count. I, I'm a failed abortion. At the age of three months, I almost died from pneumonia. I was in a hospital that they neglected the care, but God saved me. I was brought to a Seventh-day Adventist hospital, and God saved me. At the age of three years old, I was crossing a bridge and there was a river underneath and um, a guy that was drunk. He pushed me and I, down in the river, a woman saved my life by my hair. Praise God, I had a lot of hair back then. And um, by the age of uh, 21, I had a severe um, motorcycle accident and uh, I was pushed by a drunk driver. I was not as a passenger on a motor motorcycle. I was pushed out of the motorcycle. The way I felt on a, the asphalt, uh, the car that was coming behind us, the car was supposed to smash my head, the driver said. And he said the only thing I could see, it was a bright light, and it, that stopped my car from running over you. All this time, God has been protecting, healing, saving me. And I grew up in a um, Seventh-day Adventist family, but at the age of eight years old, I got baptized, doing all things because of my parents, until God started calling me to have a deep relationship with Him. God gave me a wonderful family. I'm very blessed to have a wonderful husband. My twin daughters, they are here present with me. And around a little, a, a year before COVID pandemic came, God started calling me back, calling me to have a relationship with him. And I praise him for this chance to recommit my life today to him. I praise him because my husband's here to witness, and I praise God for his patience, for his love, for his protection my whole entire life. I praise God for church family also, and I'm, I'm a blessed person. If there is anybody here that should be very thankful to God, this person is me. Happy Sabbath, thank you so much. Amen. What a wonderful testimony. Next, we have Brother Jimmy to share his testimony. Happy Sabbath, everybody. I'm sure you guys heard of my testimony on 5th November. 
Well, after uh, I gave that testimony, a couple of people approached me. Why don't you rebaptize? I was reluctant. I said, I was baptized. I'm committed to God, to the Lord. Why should I get rebaptized again? So I said, No, 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 no. Then, two days ago, Thursday, I was sleeping when I woke up. The first thing when I opened my eyes, I don't know why, something, someone prompted me to turn on the Adventist World Radio Digital Missionary app. And I saw it just scroll, and I came to I tap resources, and I looked, the first thing that came in front of me was rebaptism after backsliding. You know, I, although I was baptized in this church, but <coughs> I didn't come for quite some time, as you know. Then I was thinking, something, you know, maybe the Holy Spirit is asking me to rebaptize. That moment, I straight away I text Pastor Chun Rong and Pastor Matthew Yen. Say, hey, I'm going to be rebaptized this Saturday. Can I do it? So Chun Rong said, okay, you come uh, earlier on Thursday evening to meet him in the pastor room. So I said, okay. You know why I did this? Because things you all still doesn't know about me, I'm an uh, adventurous person. And I used to live dangerously. I ride motocross, I ride bikes and everything. And there were five occasions God saved me from death or serious injury. There were once I was riding my bike 80 kilometers per hour, I head on smashed into a car. My bike went underneath the car and I flew over the car. And I just escaped with minor scratches. And another occasion was a pickup ran the red light, traffic lights, and hit the side of my bike. I flew, I ran through his windscreen, I broke his windscreen, and I also escaped from with just a few scratches. So today, I decided to rebaptize is to testify for the Lord and inspire you guys that Lord, you know, love us despite whatever I do before. He still, you know, maintains. So he has a purpose to keep me alive. I'm sure he has a purpose for me to do something for him. Yeah. Amen. Have a good day. Can we say amen one more time? Amen. amen. Praise God for all the testimonies, His loving care and protection that wins all of them to be baptized today. We invite the baptismal candidates to the center as Pastor Yuan will offer a prayer for them before they will be baptized later. Thank you for the testimony, and it is very touching. And I have to thank God that you are willing to baptize and accept Him as your personal Savior. But the most important is when you baptize, you are one of the disciples of Jesus, which means you have to follow His example and go out to share this gospel to your friends, colleagues, and relatives, and so on. So now, before we proceed for this uh, baptism, let us have a word of prayer. Loving Father, we praise your name for this moment. We're grateful for the peace and joy that we have come to know in this world so full of unrest 
and hate. This morning we have Katya, Jimmy, Megan, Mr. Lee, and Mrs. Lee. They come to realize that all of their future rests only in Jesus alone. It is because what Jesus has done for them. As they have made the decision to accept Jesus' life and death as their own, seal this decision with power from on high. As I am going to baptize them in the name of Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and according to the example of Jesus Christ, please be with them always until his second coming. Amen. Hallelujah. This is a word that Mr. Lee always like to use. Hallelujah. Well, this is a very special occasion for Sister Katya. She baptized long, long time ago. I didn't ask her how old are you, but the first time she baptized, she was only eight years old, which means uh, she baptized without, maybe with a reason that just believe in Jesus, but after that, the life may be a little bit different than the Bible's teaching, and now she would like to re-baptize again and want to be a committed Christian. And I'm so happy that this morning with uh, Sister Katya, uh, the family of Sister Katya, Mr. Eka, and her two twin daughters. Uh, may I invite you, please come forward to the stage and then to see your wife, and also to watch your mother uh, to be baptized. Please come forward closer to the baptistry. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Dear Sister Katya, I'm so happy that today you make a decision, want to rebaptize and commit your life to Jesus again. Yes, you have accepted Jesus as your personal savior, but today is uh, meaningful for your life because not only you want to follow Jesus all the way long, but also in your personal prayer, you hope that one day, two of your daughters and also your husband would like to accept Jesus as their personal savior. So now, in the name of the Father, the, Son, the Holy Ghost, and the Father, and the Son of Jesus Christ, I baptize you in their name, Amen.
Dear Sister Megan, today you would like to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and want to follow Him throughout your life. Yes. Now I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah 因为赞美主 
sa umang lisyon na ito. Hanggang dito ko sa ito. Naya ako ay siya. Chan ay kaya naya ako ay siya. O kamsi chi. Ni pun ai zhong han shun shang dai gan dai shou duo ni ge lui ni ge mui ge yin xiang zui shou mei ni zhong yi yuan yi zhe shou ye shu zuo ni ge ren ni ge gao zhu yi ge ao fu sheng fu sheng zhi sheng ling wei li shi shui amen Hello, good morning. Happy Sabbath to all of you. You've chosen this song because Jesus is coming very soon.
scripture reading is taken from Luke chapter 1 verse 38. In Luke 1 38 it says, Then Mary said, Behold, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Before Pastor Lomo Kang speaks, we have uh, invite Elder Ellen up as we will have uh, something to present to him. Ah. Good morning, everybody, and happy Sabbath. How nice it is if we have this kind of every Sabbath, not just today. You know, uh, I would call this the high Sabbath if you want it to be. You know, you, you've got spiritual uh, baptism and all these things. So right now, we just wanted to express our gratitude and thanks for the ministry of Pastor John and Angela. Would, would you like to come up as well, Angela, please? Uh, since Pastor John is here already. Um, I know ma many of you have been blessed nightly since last Friday. And the messages, whoever have come, even for one night, I'm sure each message had uh, touched you in a certain way. You know, one time, somebody say, the message sounds like it's talking to me. You know, they are in fact unhappy. But I praise the Lord that the Spirit is speaking. Pastor John is just a man, a pastor. But the words he speaks is carried to you through the Holy Spirit touching your heart. So, as they work on the <laughs> computer, you know, um, I don't know. I... I I, nightly, I see the faces of the people who attend and they are like lighted up, all smiling. So many years. But this time I see everyone is like, wow, the message is good, the message is powerful. It's something from the Lord, brothers and sisters. And we realize we haven't been promoting it, asking for members to return the blessing from God. There's a box behind where you can, you know, return this blessing to help defray the cost of bringing our pastor and wife here. So, do what you can. And uh, right now, our pastor, Chen Rong, will present the little gift that we have for both of you. Yeah. It's a humble gift, but, you know, it's from a church. <laughs> well, uh, they are leaving tomorrow morning very early. It's a very, very early flight, 8, 8 a.m., 8.20. So on behalf of our church, please accept our gift. And uh, may I uh, ask the members to uh, be patient. As you know, the time is like, should be finished, right? But we are all waiting for a special blessing from the message of uh, Pastor John. So please, for today, give us the grace of giving us more time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Amen. Can we say amen? Just before Pastor John Lomakang speaks, on behalf of Balestier Road Church, we really appreciate his ministry in the Life of Victory series, preaching the last eight days and today the ninth day, and uh, also many other things he has done. It has been truly a blessing to us in our church, reviving us, and also reaching out to the different interests, planting seeds of truth in many. Indeed, he's engaged us that when he speaks, for an hour or so, it doesn't feel like it has been long. Time flies by. And so today, uh, as we invite him up, Pastor John Loma Kang, for those who are new, has the past uh, in Illinois Conference, and the pastor of Thompsonville Church, a pastor of over 35 years of experience uh, in 3ABN. You can find more sermons and singing of him there. So without further ado, we invite him to break with us the bread of life. Thank you, Pastor Ron. Good afternoon, everyone. 
something we don't get often an opportunity to say. We often say good morning, but in reality I say to you good afternoon. It has been such a privilege to be here. Our hearts have been warmed from the first night to the present. And we have come to appreciate Singapore in a broader way. We have been here before. I've been to Singapore twice, as you may remember, in the capacity to sing with the Heritage Singers. But this time we had a chance to look at Singapore from a forensic perspective. Understand it's underground, it's above ground, it's culture, it's food, it's people. It's commitment to cleanliness and excellence, as well as the way that you worship. And then when we go back home, we will be able to know that when we get to heaven, we're going to be able to maybe speak Chinese, I don't know. But we'll all be able to communicate in Jesus. And we look forward to that day. I want to thank my brother Alan and his wife Ivy Teo. Alan, when he reached out to my wife, I did not know that they were Facebook friends as far back as 2011. But somewhere along the way, when he was in Brunei, he reached out to us and asked me if I would, during COVID, preach a sermon for the brethren in Brunei. And I thought, where is Brunei? But then I said, there in my basement at home, I set up my video camera and preached a sermon in English to my brethren in Brunei. And that opened a door for God to <clears throat> touch our hearts in a more meaningful and substantial way. And then when Brother Alan Teo and the pastor extended the invitation for me to come here to Singapore, quite a bit of red tape, forms and forms and documents and documents, and we were wondering whether or not it was going to happen. But as I preached a few nights ago, we endured, and we have been blessed this week to get to know Alan and his wife Ivy and their sister Audrey in a meaningful way, and to see their smiles and understand their culture, and to build an affinity with our hearts, to go home every evening, to come to church every afternoon, and just converse and walk around this city together, to sit down and look in each other's eyes and get to know each other, how special that is. Also, a Pastor Chen Rong and his wife, to get to know them, to get to see them, and to, once again, realize that when we go home, these are memories that will last a long time. Sean and his wife, and uh, the list goes on and on. My mind is uh, losing the ability to remember words and names, but we will not forget faces. So thank you for being kind to us. Uh, even sitting down with our brothers far as coming from Africa, and he and his wife and daughters, to get to know them, daughter, to get to know them. But all of your smiles, your prayers, have planted in our hearts seeds that will long produce fruit. And we thank you for having uh, to sit down. Brother David, when we sat with him in his home and uh, found out he was not just a godly man, but a chef. And our stomachs were really filled with joy as we smiled from one bite to the next. Thank you so much for your hospitality. And now comes a sad reality. You know, when they say the last message, I want you to remember us not for who we are, but for who Jesus is and for what he has done in our lives. My wife and I have enjoyed our time here. We leave tomorrow morning and pray for us to have a safe flight back home, get back home uh, in a healthy manner, one thing I'm going to tell you that we are definitely going to miss, when we land, it's going to be freezing. We sure wish we could bottle and package up some warm weather and take it back home with us. But you'll have a chance if you ever want to tune in. We know the time difference is so far apart. If you ever want to join us, you can go to tvsdac.org 
and tune into our church service. It would not interrupt yours because we are living, you know, right now it's uh, Friday night in Illinois as we are here on Sabbath afternoon. Or if you don't know that, just johnlomaking.com and you can find out more about what we do and how maybe in the future, maybe near or, or distant future, but if not, we look forward to meeting in the kingdom made new. Can we all say amen? amen. Praise the Lord. This afternoon, I'm going to try to be as to the point as I can be, but I have a message that I believe fits not only the season, but gives us a more beautiful understanding of the transforming power of Christ. A number of years ago, when I preached this message for the first time, I titled it, Mary Had a Baby. But as I re-examined and looked at this sermon through the eyes of divinity, I realized that Mary did not have Jesus. Jesus had Mary. So let's begin as I bow before the Lord, asking him to guide today. Gracious Father in heaven, this is your time. I am your servant. Speak to your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to begin with a very bold statement that I just alluded to. When it comes to the changes in the Christian life, we don't have Jesus. Jesus has us. We don't have Jesus. Jesus has us. This story about the life of Christ and what he did as he came to the earth to me is probably one of the most amazing stories recorded in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke do their part to contribute, but how wonderful it is to see that the mission of Jesus was clear when he came to the earth. He said so clearly in the word, and we find this in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, these very important words. We read in Matthew 1, 21, if you have your Bibles, listen to what we read. And the Bible says, speaking of Mary, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name, what's his name? Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. You know, I look at my life where I was and where I am today, and I praise the Lord that his mission to earth was not just to show us the Father, but to save us from that which we could never save ourselves from. He doesn't save us in our sins. He saves us from our sins. As we dive into the forensic nature of the story, to the geological understanding, to the time frame. This story unfolded 14 generations after the Israelites were freed from Babylonian captivity. And when we look at Babylonian captivity, it was there in Babylon that the angel Gabriel visited Daniel. But 14 generations later, the angel Gabriel was still busy, and he shows up in the life of Mary. And very few people understand the reality of having Jesus in their lives like a little teenage girl named Mary. Historically, I studied the story. And there was a possibility that Mary was between 15 to 18 years old. And her husband-to-be was much older, maybe about 29 or 30 years old. The illusion was that he was married before because he had other children. But this young girl, I could imagine what it was like when she was about to be revolutionarily turned inside out by a power and a presence that she had not known. Imagine, imagine being Mary. I could say today with certainty that if Mary had an option to choose how Jesus would come into the world, I am sure that she would have chosen for Jesus to come into the world quite differently. But let me make another statement. Mary was not in control of Jesus. Jesus was in control of Mary. If you have your Bibles, go to the book of Luke chapter 1, and we're going to watch this story as it unfolds in a marvelous way. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. The Bible says, 
Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, speaking of Gabriel, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. We read that story and we say how beautiful that really was. But how many times have you been brushing your teeth or combing your hair or getting ready to go to work in the morning and an angel shows up in your house? or an angel shows up in your life, or an angel just breaks into the solitude of your morning as you get ready. The Bible does not give the time of day. The Bible does not tell us where the encounter occurred. It doesn't say it was morning, evening, or noon. But I can say this, wherever that encounter was, it was something that Mary never experienced before. Mary reacted like any one of us would have reacted as we heard that kind of salutation. Notice these words in verses 29 and 30 of the book of Luke. But when she saw him, she was troubled at a saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. First of all, who are you? And why are you in my room? Or why are you in my home? Or why are you in my presence? A man standing there, obviously one she had never seen before, only to realize in the divine context this was the same angel that replaced Lucifer when he fell. From generation to generation, Gabriel was busy. What a salutation. The Bible says in verse 30, Then the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. God chose Mary because Mary was loyal to God. My brothers and sisters, when we are loyal to God, we receive favor from God. God sent Gabriel to Mary, and God looked at the life of this young lady not because she was perfect. From generation to generation, when you study the history of the Israelites, Whenever a woman had a child that was a male child, they all were praying that this would be the Christ child. So for this young girl to be the one chosen of God, placed in favor of God, to have God put your name on his preference list is a magnificent blessing. God chose Mary and used Mary to reveal his loyalty. And thus it is also true about us. In 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, we read these words. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth, the whole earth, to show himself strong in behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. God is waiting for those who are loyal to him to fill their lives as he did Mary's to reveal to the world the very thing that they need, a savior, a lord, a king, someone who not only brings good news, but removes the darkness of our past. One who brings hope in the midst of pain, one who brings freedom in the midst, in the midst of bondage, one who can lead us away from our past to a glorious future. But the conditions are clear. God shows himself strong in behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. As the story continues to unfold, you discover that this was not an everyday occurrence in the life of Mary. Her eyes and her voice said it all. Gabriel, looking at this timid young lady, fearful of what was taking place, he didn't stop. He kept on talking to her. Notice Luke chapter 1, verses 31 to 33. We read these words. Imagine how her ears received these salutations. Gabriel said, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name. What is his name, friends? Jesus. 
He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Ah, right away, the angel reveals his lineage. But then he reveals his divine lineage. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. In that one statement, the angel Gabriel says that this child that is to be born is the child that brings humanity and divinity together. David is his earthly father, but his heavenly father. His lineage is of the house of Jacob, but his heavenly lineage means that his kingdom will have no end. My brothers and sisters, this morning, as you look at the grandeur of Singapore, all that it can offer to you, remember this, connect your life to him whose kingdom has no end, whose joys are forevermore, who has a throne that is never occupied by anyone but the Christ. I love Singapore, but I'm looking forward to heaven. What about you? Mary listens to these words. Gabriel's mission was very clear, but Mary is, st is still trying to put this biological incident together in her mind. And she responds in verse 34 of Luke chapter 1 with these words. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be? I do not know a man. When I read that statement, I said to myself, Mary got high grades in a class on biology. She's wondering, I'm not married. I've never been, I've never been connected to a man physically. I don't know how this is going to be. How can this be? Since Joseph and I are not yet married, how can this be? Which brings you to a very vitally important point. Mary understood this. The natural cannot produce the spiritual. The natural man cannot produce spiritual results. She understood that. She says, what you're saying to me sounds plausible, but how am I in my humanity going to be able to accomplish anything divine? That is why the Lord says to us, if you want a divine revelation in your life, if you want the power of God to be resident, flowing into your life, through your life, onto the life of others, there's something that every one of us must have. There has to be a transition between the natural and the spiritual. And that's why Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and verse 7, do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Mary was planning her wedding. Mary was hoping and desiring to one day walk down the aisle with her husband Jacob. I mean, Joseph. Mary had all the ideologies and all the plans to one day hear the words, you may now kiss your bride. And that did not happen yet. And so she's saying, how can this be? How can this be? And the angel Gabriel goes forward with his divine commission. And he says in Luke 1 and verse 35, and the angel answered and said to her, Look at the divine connection in the, human, in the human frailties. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Just imagine being this young lady, being told that before her wedding, she's going to be pregnant. Just try to imagine what kind of situation and what kind of dilemma this places Mary in. I mean, she's hoping to have a child one day, but not two days. Bring me down just a touch, my brother, just a little touch. Mary is planning to have a child one day but not before she hears you are now husband and wife. She's hoping to have a child one day, but she was hoping that she and her husband Joseph could share in this wonderful, transforming, excellent gift. 
But an angel now shows up and says, I want to let you know, God had this plan a long time ago. God chose her from eons ago. God saw that this moment, this woman, this young lady was the vessel that God had chosen to be the delivery system for the Most High God. Now, young ladies, think about it. You try explaining to your mother. <laughs> you try explaining to your mother, Mom, you know, this morning when I was brushing my teeth, uh, there was this guy that showed up in my room. He said his name was Gabriel. Right off the bat, your mother might say, you mean Joseph? No, Gabriel. Who's Gabriel? Does Joseph know Gabriel? I don't know. But I think he'll meet him sooner or later. So what happened when Gabriel showed up? Well, Mom, you see, um, see, Mom, um, well, what he, well, what he said was, yes, what did he say? Well, are you okay, Mary? Well, see, Mom, he told me that I'm going to be pregnant. Mary, who's Gabriel, really? Who is Gabriel? Is this some kind of side relationship you're having that Joseph is not aware of? What do you mean Gabriel told you that you're going to be pregnant? Does Joseph know this? Well, see, Mom, I don't know how to explain it. Immediately, her mother would have suspected that this young girl was having, oh, how can I say it, church, help me out, was having some kind of unauthorized connection <laughs> before her wedding day. I can imagine her mother sitting down and saying, I've got to process this one. Are you going to tell Joseph? No, Mom, you tell Joseph. <laughs> you see, there are times that we are glad that Jesus shows up in our lives. But there are other times that when he shows up, we are immediately confronted with a predicament. In this situation, Mary realizes that she is in a, what we call in America, a catch-22. How do I tell Joseph? How do I explain this to the pastor who's going to perform my wedding that as I'm walking down the aisle, I'm already pregnant? How do I, how do I try to figure this out that before Joseph and I has relationship, that there's a child being born in me. You know, friends, the good news about this is there are times when we are caught in a predicament and God knows exactly where to direct our footsteps because everything that we face, chances are there's somebody who understands, which brings me to my fourth point, a very profound point. God's greatest blessings often appear as our worst dilemma. I know you just said amen, but I just didn't hear it. God's greatest blessings often begin as our worst dilemma. Why? Because when the Lord comes into our lives, let me step out a little bit. When the Lord comes into our lives, before he turns our lives right side up, he turns our lives upside down exactly how he did in Mary's life. Her life was to be an example for generations, eons, thousands of years beyond that moment. She did not understand how she would be revered from generation to generation, but it didn't begin that way. It began as the worst dilemma. And yet, before Gabriel left, he said to Mary, you are not the only one in this circumstance. You are not the only one in a similar situation. He gives the directions. There's somebody that you need to go see right away, and it's not Joseph. Notice his words in Luke chapter 1, verse 36 and 37. He said to her, Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, have also conceived a son in her old age. 
And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. And I love this part. For with God, can we see that together? Nothing will be impossible. Now look at the situation very carefully. Mary, not, not married yet, pregnant with child. Elizabeth, too old to be pregnant, has a child. God sometimes cannot be explained. That's why he is God. He takes a young girl in a predicament, sends her to an older woman who is also in a predicament. When you study the story of Elizabeth, you come to discover that her husband, Zachariah, is so confused about how her birth took place that the Lord shuts his mouth because he doubted God's divine ability. God says, you doubt me, you won't, be able, you won't be able to say another word until this child is born. And so Mary immediately leaves town, runs to be with Elizabeth, but before she leaves, notice what she says. And this is how God works. Luke 1, verse 38. Then Mary said, Behold, the maid servant of the Lord. And these next words are the words of a person who wants his or her life to be transformed. Notice what she says. Let it be to me according to your word. Watch this. Let it be to me according to your word. I have to say this. When we say to God, let it be to me according to your word, that's when our lives are transformed. That's when our lives are changed. When we allow God's word to be the active power in our lives and are able to say as she did, Lord, I don't know what's in here. I don't know what you're up to next, but let it be to me according to your word. And when Gabriel sees that her heart is open to trusting God, notice what he does. And the angel departed from her. Wow. What a circumstance. He left, pregnant and young, unmarried. Don't tell Joseph, you just better leave town. What a circumstance to be in. And so the question is, what does Mary do in this situation? When Jesus shows up in our lives and begins to transform us, what is true about Mary is also true about us, which brings me to my fifth point. In the worst of times, genuine obedience will remain intact. In the worst of times, genuine obedience remains intact. Mary doesn't know how the rest of the story is going to unfold, but one thing she knows, she says, I'm going to let the Lord do in my life what he desires to do in my life. I will let the Lord take care of the rest. And so she leaves town in her dilemma, and she's dispatched immediately to connect with another person who had a divine encounter with God again. Look at Luke chapter 1, verse 39 and 40. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with what? With haste. She didn't leave Joseph a text, no emails, no cell phone calls, no notes on the wall. She left in a hurry to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. This is amazing. When Mary enters the house where Elizabeth is, and Zacharias is sitting there not being able to say a word, there is an immediate divine connection between the baby being born and Mary. Remember, the, the seed just got planted. This is, this is biologically amazing. This is forensically almost seems impossible. The seed just got planted. Did you get that? She did not leave when she was in her second or third month. Gabriel just told her she's pregnant. She accepts his statement by faith and she runs to go to Elizabeth and as she enters, notice what happens. Notice what happens. This is powerful. Look at Luke chapter 1 verse 41 to 44. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, 
that the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 42. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, look at these words, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, this is powerful, for indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. I had, to, I had to process this because I go back, and by the way, I'm going to make a statement here that I'm not going to ask you what you believe and what you don't believe, but I'm going to make this statement. This is the reason why life is sacred at every stage. John the Baptist is being born in Elizabeth, and she's in her sixth month. Mary just had a divine seed planted in her, and the babe in Elizabeth's womb, by some divine transaction, recognizes that the seed, what word did I just say? You can talk. The seed in Mary is the seed of divinity. No fingers or toes or arms or legs yet, but just at the stage of a seed, and God makes a divine connection between the Christ child being born in Mary and the baby in its sixth month of development in Elizabeth. Only divinity can make that kind of connection, which says to me, that's the reason why life is sacred at every point once the gestation begins. Once there is a divine spark of life, God considers that life to be valuable. As I studied this story further, it was amazing to me how the Bible unfolds this amazing situation. Because Mary was not carrying Jesus, Jesus was carrying Mary. Mary became a temporary den for the lion of the tribe of Judah. At that moment, Mary became a momentary garden for the Rose of Sharon. In Mary, the bright and morning star was about to rise again. Mary became the olive branch out of which the oil of gladness would eventually flow to a hurting world. And friends, when you think about it, thank the Lord that Jesus became a step-down transformer because there was enough power in Mary to annihilate the entire world. But Jesus, considering her human frailty, veiled his glory in the flesh of humanity. Had he not done so, Mary would have ceased to exist. So why does God do that? He does the same thing today. He veils his divinity in the flesh of humanity. But nonetheless, when humanity and divinity connects, there is a divine connection that brings about endless possibilities. And so you see, through Elizabeth, God confirmed to Mary that divinity was in charge and divinity was working out his heavenly plan. Look at verse 45 of Luke chapter 1. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Elizabeth is confirming and encouraging Mary. This, Mary, is a circumstance where divinity is in charge, but keep this in mind. I want you to see the story because we're listening to it as a Christmas story or maybe something that happens once a year, but it's far deeper than that because this is where God's blessing becomes a real dilemma. Keep in mind, we cannot keep Joseph out of the story too long, which says to me, point number six, Divine interruptions produce divine results. But there's somebody else in the story that needs to be brought in. There's Elizabeth, Zacharias, and Mary. But what about Joseph? Joseph right now is maybe wondering, what happened to my wife? What happened to my wife-to-be? No letters are sent. 
no calls, no emails, no phone calls. He's wondering, and the wedding plans, when he cannot find his bride-to-be, I could imagine he probably said, let's hold off on these wedding plans. I don't know where my bride is. The Bible says Mary stays away, not for one week, not for two weeks, not for one month, not for two months, but notice the scriptures. Luke chapter 1, verse 56 to 57. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her house. Now Elizabeth's full time came for her to be delivered, and she brought forth a son. Now, I've never had a baby. You ought to say amen to that. <laughs> I've seen women that have been pregnant, and I've seen them have babies, not seen them have babies. Let me correct that. But I've seen them as they are in the process of having a child. Mary stays away for how many months? Now, ladies, you know, you know very well that something happens in the third month that did not happen in the first month, did not happen in the second month, but something begins to happen in the third month. I remember when my wife, my wife's sister was pregnant and I was living in New York City. My wife was away at college. And one evening, my sister-in-law and I, before we were married, we went downtown Brooklyn together and we were sitting on the bus and there were two older ladies sitting across from us and I was sitting with her sister who was pregnant at the time and these two older ladies looked over us, over at us and went like, oh how cute. And I went to them, no, no, not my child. <laughs> but I never forget, I still see that today in the picture of her sister. Her face is all aglow. There's, there's, it is as though God turns on a light from the inside. What is the point I'm making? You see, you, you may be able, when Jesus is being born in you, you may be able to hide him for a week or a month or maybe two months, but after a while, there will be external evidence of an inward change. Now, let's put this in the context. She goes back home after three months of pregnancy, and there's a little <laughs> bump. Now she has to go talk to Joseph. They got to figure this thing out. She's got to break the news to her husband that's saying, man, I can't get it by phone, by text. She's not answering her emails. She's not on WhatsApp or on Facebook either. All of a sudden, he hears the door. Mary, where have you been? He may have been nicer than that. Uh, <coughs> see, jo uh, Joseph, I've got to tell you something. And Joseph says, I'm hungry. Fish me, fix me a Vegalink or a griller or something vegetarian. And so she walks to the kitchen backwards so that her tummy doesn't face Joseph. And she says, now, Joseph, do you remember all those stories we heard about the coming Messiah? And Joseph says, oh, yes. Yes, Mary. We are all looking forward to the day when Jesus will arrive. What a glorious day that will be. She says, wouldn't that be nice? A wonderful, glorious day. Wouldn't it be beautiful and gorgeous? Yes. All the world. Joseph clicks into his theological context. What a joy that will be for humanity to welcome the, the wonderful Savior that we have looked for for, for millennia. Yes, Joseph, that's going to be a wonderful thing. Yes, Mary, how wonderful. But wait, 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 wait. Why are we talking about the coming of Jesus? Why are we talking about the Christ child? Well, uh, uh, well, you see, Joseph, like three months ago, yes, um, he said his name was Gabriel. Yeah. Who's Gabriel? Hold on. Uh, he, he appeared in my house. There was another man in your house? 
that was not me yet. Well, no, no, it wasn't a man. He said he was an angel. Hmm, an angel, huh? So you found a guy better than me, an angel, huh? Well, act not that kind of angel. No. And he told me something that I need to tell you. He told you this how long ago? Three months ago. Would this have anything to do with explaining why you've been gone for three months? Yeah. All right, spill the beans. What is it? Well, well see, um, he said that... Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm pregnant. What? 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 What do you say? Ah, uh, she tries to fix it. We're gonna have a child. What do you mean we're gonna have a child? We are not even married yet. And so while we're sitting there with Joseph and he's going through his dilemma, and Mary is sweating in her Middle Eastern garments. All of a sudden, she realizes that there comes a point in your life, there comes a point in our lives when it is impossible to conceal the Christ being born in us. Which brings me to my point number seven. I just have three more, and we'll finish today. I promise you'll get home before midnight. I, I promise that. <laughs> when Jesus is being born in us, it is impossible to hide the evidence. Oh, my brothers and sisters, can I make a point here? If Christ is in your life, there ought to be a visible difference between your life and those who live for the world. Can you say amen? There ought to be a marked change. If there's something spiritual happening within, within you on the inside, there ought to be some external evidence that you are not the same person you were before. You, you, you change in so many ways. You eat differently, you dress differently, you walk differently, you talk differently, you're a kinder individual. All these are evidences that the Christ is being born in us. You see this phrase as today, being born again, being baptized. When you step over the line and allow divinity to come into your life, make, let me make the statement, Jesus does not want to participate in our lives. He wants to invade our lives. That's why Matthew 5 and verse 16 says these words. Here it is, Matthew 5 and verse 16. When Christ is in your life, you can't hide him. Notice the first word. What's the first word, friends? Let, meaning let divinity have its way. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. There ought to be external evidence of the inward change. But the next point is so vitally important because when Christ comes into your life, there are many people that may be comfortable with who you are before Christ comes into your life. But I want to tell you, as my good friend Elder C.D. Brooks once told me, and actually he once preached this, he says, somebody asked the question, Elder Brooks, what do I do with my friends when I give my life to Jesus? And I really appreciate his answer. He says, you don't have to get rid of your friends. Your friends will get rid of you. When Christ comes into our lives, there are those who are comfortable, comfortable with who we are before Christ, but they don't remain comfortable after Christ. And such was the case with her husband Joseph. Look at Matthew. Matthew chimes in. Did Joseph accept the news without any interruption? Here's what the Bible says. Matthew 1 verse 19, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away how? Secretly. In other words, he was saying, I need to find a way to just end this marriage before it gets any worse. I need to find a way to fix this situation so that you nor I would be shamed. Because, friends, when you study the context of this situation, three things could have happened to Mary. Mary could have been barred from the temple services from ever being allowed to go to the temple services. Secondly, Mary could have been forbidden from ever being married again. But even more worse than those first two things, Mary could have been stoned to death 
for immorality in that generation. So Joseph, considering the impact that she's about to experience, the Bible says he was thinking about putting Mary away secretly. What says to me, I tell you, you can talk about Jesus all you want and how much he's changed your life, but there's a difference between what you read and what you experience. There's a major difference between what we read in God's Word and what God does in our lives. It oftentimes puts us into a predicament, which brings me to my eighth point, and here it is. Natural invitation cannot compare to divine invasion. Natural invitation cannot compare to divine invasion. What do I mean? It's easy to say, Lord Jesus, I want you in my prayer life. I want you in my study life. I want you in my witnessing life. But when you say, Jesus, I want you in my entire life, that's not participation, that's invasion. Jesus did not come to change us partially. Jesus came to change us completely. Can you say amen? He wants to be involved in every part of our lives. That is one of the reasons why I chose to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Because he does not affect my life just when it comes to the Sabbath. But my life ought to be different on Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. Every day I ought to make decisions that are in harmony with who Jesus is every day. My life is not a few hours with Christ. When Jesus comes in, he doesn't come in to participate. He comes in to invade. And Joseph realized our lives are not going to be the same again. And so what does he do? What does he do? He's trying to figure out what I'm going to do with my wife. And all of a sudden, I praise God for the rest of the verse. Matthew 1 and verse 20. But while he thought about these things... Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Oh, I appreciate this passage because, you know, when we're trying to explain to our family members why we eat this way, why we dress this way, why we worship this way, why we accept the Sabbath, things that people don't understand. When we try to sort out our spiritual change and people are just not getting it, I praise God that He sometimes sends divine intervention so that your family members can be visited by the Lord so that they can understand that what's taking place in your life is not a choice you made, but a simple surrender that you make to Christ. When we surrender to Christ, all the changes that are made in us are not made by us, but they're made by Him. Thank you for the Singapore Amen. <laughs> Let your light so shine. You see, friends, we don't have the light. The light has us. We don't have Jesus. Jesus has us. The angel Gabriel made it very clear to Joseph what was taking place. Notice what he said in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. He said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. You see, without the Holy Spirit, any attempt to make a change in our lives will be nothing more than behavioral modification. And you can only keep up this pretense of Christianity. But when it is driven by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, you don't have to worry about when to be nice and when not to be nice, or when to be clean and when not to be clean, or when to be worldly and when to be like a Christian. The Spirit of God will keep your life consistent every day of the week. Spiritual transformation is something that the Bible describes. It is not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit. Now let me close. This is the part of the story that I've been laying all the foundation for. This is the part of the story that really brings my mind to, the un to understand the reality and the changes that come into our lives when Jesus takes over. You see, we are never in control when we submit our lives to Christ. That's why Jesus himself said, not my will, but your will be done. So let's go ahead and look at, we're going to look at some comparisons. The comparison I end with is, Jesus being born in Mary, 
who is now pregnant in Christ being born in us. When we allow the Lord to enter our lives, what happens? Notice the first thing that I've drawn from this comparison between a pregnant woman and a pregnant Christian. I want to be a pregnant Christian. Come on, somebody, say amen. A pregnant Christian is just like a pregnant woman. Here's the evidence of that. What happens when a woman is pregnant? I think you're going to see, I think you're going to see the health message in a completely different light. You see, when women are pregnant, they change the way they eat. Can I get a testimony from a pregnant woman? Come on, raise your hand. If you've ever had a child before, only two people had children in here, that's, that's okay. <laughs> you change the way you eat. And I study this thing. I try to look at the biological side of that. And so I asked the doctor, what is it? So what, why do women change the way they eat? And I learned something that is powerful. Also, it relates to the Christian life. She changes the way she eats. How does she eat? She eats abundantly. She eats regularly. She eats strange stuff, ice cream and pickles. And she tries to explain to people that are watching her eat some unusual things. Why are you a vegetarian? You see, friends, we're not vegetarians because we want to change the way we eat. But why does the woman change the way she eats? Because the baby requires and makes the changes. Amen. She changes the way she eats, not because she wants a different diet, but the baby says, you got to eat differently. And in order for me to survive, you've got to eat abundantly and regularly. What am I saying? If you want Jesus to survive in your life, come on, let's talk about the bread of life. You got to eat abundantly and regularly. Come on, say amen. You can't be snacking on the Bible and expect Jesus to survive in your life. You can't have just a two-minute morning watch and expect this baby and you to be healthy. You can't just be a Christian that's a Christian one day, eat just one day, and expect to have a healthy relationship with Christ. Like Mary, let me tell you today, brothers and sisters, if you want the Jesus in you to be healthy and strong and powerful and thriving, you've got to eat abundantly and regularly. And finally, don't try to explain it. Let the people see the difference between the way that you eat of the Word of God, the way that you digest God's Word, they will give God glory for the changes that are being made in you. She eats abundantly and regularly. Not only that, ha! I've seen women change the way they dress. You try to wear that tight dress when you are four months pregnant, see what happens. <laughs> so what happens is they say, wait, wait, wait. Your husband say, honey, you can't go out dressing like that. You got to, you got to, you didn't get this. Some of us think that, wow, this is powerful. This is, this is amazing. This is going to mess you up for the rest of the year. We don't understand dress reform the way the Bible teaches it. Some of us think that we have to change the way we dress because we're Seventh-day Adventists. Oh, wait a minute. You missed it. If you think you're changing the way you dress to, uh, to, to describe your, your denomination, you have missed the whole thing. The only reason for the change in our dress is that Jesus being born in us brings about a change that we have absolutely no control over. So the woman changes the way she dresses. Not wearing short and tight stuff anymore because she's got a baby to protect and a reputation to protect. She's changing the way she dresses because nothing in her, this is powerful, nothing in her wardrobe before Jesus fits anymore. Now the Singapore amen, I appreciate it. <laughs> Nothing in her prior wardrobe fits. She gets clothes that are more modest and more appropriate for a woman that's pregnant. She changes the way she dresses because the baby says, 
You're squeezing the life out of me. You need to have some looser fitting clothing. Amen, ladies. Help the brothers out. <laughs> the next thing is, when a woman is pregnant, I've seen them before. See, they, they walk differently. You can't explain it. When Jesus is being born in your life, he ought to change the way you walk. That's why the Bible says, he that has this hope in himself purifies himself just as he is pure. We are, so, we are also to walk just as he walked. We can't walk as he walked unless he's being born in our lives. What does that mean? We don't listen to what we used to listen to. We don't go where we used to go. We don't eat or, or, or follow the patterns of the world like we used to before. Why? Because the baby is bringing about the changes. You see, this is what righteousness by faith is all about. Sometimes people say, I like your diet, so I'm going to eat like an Adventist. That's not new birth. That's just modified behavior. You could be a vegetarian and still be lost because it's not the diet that saves you, but the baby that brings about the change. It is not the dress that saves you, but the baby that brings about the reason for the change in dress. This is the inward gestation of Christ being born in you, and that's why the Apostle Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. She changes the way she walks. She can't walk the way she used to walk. She can't live the way she used to live. And anybody believe that Christ is in her life? I learned that a hard way. When I first gave my life to the Lord, you see what happened? I gave my life to the Lord. I did not, Lord, I did not allow the Lord to invade my life. I gave him my Sabbaths first. I didn't give him my disc jockey nights. I partied from Thursday to Sunday. Thursday was mine, Lord. Friday's mine. I'll give you Sabbath morning. Sunday is mine. But when the Lord came into my life in a powerful way, Thursday was his, Friday was his, Sabbath was his, Sunday was his, Monday was his, Tuesday was his. Amen, somebody. That's the difference between you saying, well, I think I can come to church tomorrow. Think. You will never find in the Bible any place where Jesus stayed home on the Sabbath. He went into the synagogue as his custom was. Every Sabbath, Jesus was in church. Now, Pastor, I'm challenging you now because now you see how people can come to church. So after we leave, I'm challenging you, my brothers and sisters. You see, I, I praise God. You got to keep your mask on if you want to or don't wear it if you don't want to. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to say that, Pastor. Follow the rules of the church. But whether you have on a mask or not, you should come to church. You know why? Because that is how the baby in you is going to survive. Thank you, honey. My wife is preaching the sermon with me. Hebrews 10.25, Forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, and so much the more as we see the day fast approaching. Don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together. If you're going to get ready for heaven, the time to do it is right now. The other thing is, the woman keeps her prenatal appointments. Oh, man, this is powerful. This is going to really mess us up for a long time. She keeps her appointments. As a pastor, I'm still trying to get this through the heads of my own members. So I'm not just talking to you. Because for whatever reason, somehow in the minds of those of us who work for Jesus, we figure if we work for him and we are on television and we do programs and we do evangelism, then we don't have to come to Wednesday night Bible study. Yet how much more important it is, I'm sure that if there was a football game in Singapore and there was a championship here, that people will come every time the doors were open for that championship game. What am I saying? When the woman wants her baby to be healthy, she makes all of her doctor's appointments. She checks her levels. She makes sure that the baby is moving along healthily in the very same way. Whenever the doors of the church are open, brothers and sisters, we need to keep our appointment with God. I know you believe it. And finally...
When you go from three, when you go from no months to two months to three months to five months to nine months, <laughs> that was hard. I take my hat off to you, ladies. They tell me that the doctor is really good at giving you a general idea of when that baby's going to arrive. So the doctors say, your baby's going to be born December 22nd. But the reality is, he doesn't really know. That's just a good educated guess. But how does the woman know? Ooh, this is deep. She starts feeling pains that she never felt before. Those are called birth pangs. The body is beginning to adjust as the baby turns around, ready to come on out, ready to be delivered. She, oh. You okay, honey? Oh, I just had a pain. Oh. I had another pain. Oh. You know what? I need to get my bags ready because I don't know whether, whether or not this gonna, baby's going to come today or tomorrow. What is Pastor John saying? The birth pangs we see in the world, the troubles, the heartaches, the volcanoes, the earthquakes, the financial instability, the political uncertainty, all these birth pangs are indications that Jesus is on his way. But the Bible says this. I know you want to see it. Here it is. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 13. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So what does the woman do when she thinks that her baby is soon to come? They tell me that she packs her bag and get ready for the moment that that water breaks, she's ready to go. Brothers and sisters, be ye ready for none of us know the hour that Jesus comes. We ought to be ready today for the coming of the Son of Man. Amen, somebody. Nobody knows the day nor the hour when Jesus is coming. And I've heard women tell the stories about the birth pains. You see, friends, what's the story told today? Changing without Jesus is controlled behavior, but changes through Jesus is conversion. Now, this brings me to my last point, and this is going to be the most powerful one of the, of the day, of the afternoon. What made Mary so special? Once Jesus came into Mary's life, Mary did not use Jesus to do her work. Jesus used Mary to do his work. Oh, yes. Here it is, since you want to see it. When Jesus comes into our lives, it is God who works in us, both to will and to do of his good, say it, pleasure. So here's the key. As I close, here is the key to successful Christian living. Here it is. Here it is. Don't use God to do your work. Let God use you to do his work. Come on, say amen. I've seen the first thing happening. So many religious leaders use God to accomplish their work. I want God to use me to accomplish his work. Anybody else here today? God wants to use us to accomplish his work. Never take God's gifts to rob God of his glory. What is the story of the birth? What is the birth story? What's the spiritual application in Jesus being born in Mary? Everything I've said thus far, but I think the most important thing I want to leave with you today is when Christ comes into your life, he's not coming in for you to use him for your works. He's coming in so that he can, use you, he can use you for his works. And all the changes that need to be made, the Lord will make that. You see, today, friends, the reality is in this last song I sing, Mary did not have a baby. A baby had Mary. God led Mary. Mary did not lead God. And today, as I sing this closing song, God wants to lead you. He wants to be in your life. It is not up to you to determine where God leads, but say like Mary did, let it be to you, let it be to me according to your word. I'm going to ask you a question today. How many of you want God to lead your life? Raise your hands. Should be everybody in here. He may lead some of us through the fire, through the water, through the floods, 
But let me encourage you, when that journey on earth is done, if you commit your life to God to allow him to lead you, not only would God lead his dear children along, but the last stop in our journey with Jesus is in the kingdom made new. If that's your desire today as I sing this closing song, I pray that in your heart and in your mind you'll say, Father, today I want you to lead me, not because I have a plan for your life, but because you have a plan for my life. As I sing this song, if it is your desire today to commit your life to the Lord and do what Mary did so that the evidence of Christ in you can be clearly seen, as I sing the song, I'm not asking you to come forward, but just stand as a testament to heaven, as a testament to heaven that today you want Christ to work his works in you that the world will see that the glory of God can be revealed in humanity. Listen to this message. More in the house, more in the house. In shady green pastures, so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along. Little more, Ken. Where the water's cool flow, he bathes the weary one's feet as God leads his children along. Some through the water and some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood some through great sorrows but God gives a song in the night seasons and all the day long Listen. With sorrows before us and Satan opposed, God leads his dear children along. Through faith we will conquer, we'll defeat all our foes, for God leads his children along he leads some through the water and some through the flood some through the fire but all through his blood so through great sorrows yet God gives a song in your night season in our night seasons and all the day Let us pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, we are always amazed this time of year when we rehearse and revisit the story of Mary, 
this humble servant, Joseph, this frail young woman chosen by divinity to be the delivery system of the greatest gift that this world has ever received, the gift of the person of Jesus. But I pray, Lord, today that we have learned a few lessons, and one is we don't want Jesus to participate in our lives. Our prayer is that Jesus would invade our lives, that all the changes and transformations that are seen to the world will be the result of Christ being born and growing in us. You will change our walk. You'll change our lifestyle. You'll change our habits. We will truly understand what it means. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so, Lord, take us from this place in this Christmas season as the lights twinkle and the trees give off the scent of a new and glorious season. May we desire something more than a gift wrapped in beautiful ribbons, but may we settle for nothing less than Christ being wrapped in our human flesh, revealing to the world the glorious news that though our sins were as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. Though they were red like crimson, everything can be made new. They shall be as wool. And so send us forth from this place, not religious people, but transformed people, not people that have good practices in their lives, but people whose lives are invaded by the only one that is good, the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the good news of this season, but may it resonate in our lives every day and all year long. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pastor. Something I want to make very clear today as we think about the beauty of Mary's story is that Mary is not the one that we worship. We worship the Jesus in Mary. She's simply the vessel through which the glorious news of the Savior has come to our world. I think this is going to happen here. Is it working? Our Father and our God, we thank you in Jesus' name today. We thank you, Lord, that your purpose can be accomplished through human frailty that the story of Mary is not one of human effort or human intuitiveness or human ingeniousness or just our ability to figure out what righteous living is all about. But it's one of the power of divine transformation. And Father, we pray that through this we can learn the valuable lesson that it continues to resonate every season of Christmas. Mary is seen as someone of grand importance in the scheme of divinity. But Lord, we have not come to honor Mary, but to honor the Jesus that came through Mary. And so bless us, we pray. Guide us, we ask. Give us wisdom and understanding to know that as we tell the Christmas story, it is about Jesus, the greatest gift, the eternal gift, the power and the glory that comes through the living Savior in us. So send us forth transformed, not just informed, that the message that the mountains are resonating can also come through our lives. We ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.